Okay. But can you see my screen? We can see you, man, not the screen. Man. Not the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can see the screen now. The screen now. Okay. Yes. Good nutrition is important at every stage of life, and the nutrition challenges continue throughout the life cycle, especially for girls and women. It starts in utero and extends into adolescence and adulthood. If a girl child has a nutritional problem, especially undernutrition, there's usually additive negative impact on the birth weight of her child. So if somebody has undernutrition and the girl grows up to become an adolescent and that adolescent now gives birth to a baby, since there is undernutrition and the reserve in that adolescent is not enough and she now gets pregnant, she will not have enough to also nourish the baby and that baby is likely to come out with low birth weight. And when a child is undernourished in utero, some organs that are developing at the time of nutritional insult can have problems. And that's what we describe as the fetal origin of disease. In other words, if uh, the heart is developing at the time of nutritional insult, then that child can have heart problems later on in life. Or if it's a pancreas, what is the child likely to have? Diabetes. So the short and long-term um, benefits of investing into good nutrition should be well known by every member of this class. As we um, discuss this night, you will note some of them, but I want you to take note of the economic impact of um, undernutrition. It's very important in this course because when a child is undernourished, please note your question so that I'm not distracted and I can uh, put in my best uh, in the lecture. Somebody is raising up hand. Maybe it's a mistake or it's intentional. Please lower your hand. If you have questions, note your questions till the end of the class. John Ajao. Thank you. So there is short-term benefits and there's long-term benefits. And my emphasis is on the long-term benefit because some of you are likely to know the short-term benefit. And if a child is well-nourished, that child will not, uh, the immunity will be top-notch. The child will not have infections or fall ill often like its counterparts who are undernourished. And the, the, the child that is undernourished can is, that can easily succumb to infection, can even die, and several other things that can happen in the short term. But the long-term uh, benefits of investing into good nutrition is economic uh, development, because that child that is well-nourished, the brain will develop properly. The child will do well in school, will do well in life, will be productive. And when you have many of such children in the society, that society, will be more developed than a society where many of the children are undernourished. The cycle of poor nutrition is perpetrated across generations. As somebody has just explained, make sure you understand the concept quite well. Uh, the different stages of life that we'll be talking about is prenatal. That means during pregnancy, before birth, then infanthood, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and old age. The prenatal uh, stage, the baby is in the womb. The earth of the fetus depends on that of the mother. That means if the mother is undernourished, the fetus is also likely to be undernourished. What do they obey? You are distracting the class. Malnourished mother usually gives birth to malnourished infants. And the opposite can be true. An overweight mother can also give birth to overweight baby. And when a baby is overweight in childhood, likely to continue into adulthood. Hmm. 
The infant suffer the consequences of deficiency more than the mother in some situations like vitamin B12 deficiency. I'd like you to know that during this prenatal stage, the requirement, the extra requirement to support the pregnancy is not necessarily um, what is uh, required by an average adult. So that means the pregnant woman cannot eat for two. So the idea of a pregnant woman eating for two should be debunked because some people actually um, become overweight and find it difficult to lose the unnecessary fat stored during pregnancy because they're not aware or they're not conscious of the fact that the energy requirement is just extra 300 kilocalories daily. Imagine a young lady who normally eats uh, food that will supply 2,000 kilocalories daily and the person starts eating double. So that means that person will be eating 4,000 kilocalories rather than 2,300. I hope that is clear. The extra energy requirement is just about 300 kilocalories on the average. The extra protein requirement is 14 grams. Ideally, a lady that weighs 60 kilograms should be consuming protein that is about 48 grams because an average adult requires 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilograms per day. So if you convert that um, for a 60 kg lady, so that's 60 times 0 0.8 and it's going to give you 48 grams. So an average lady who is not pregnant requires 48 grams of protein. But when she gets pregnant, then she requires 14 grams extra. So that's 62. That's for protein. The folic acid and other vitamins are required in um, higher amounts. For folic acid is special. The amount is a lot more than uh, somebody who is not pregnant because that folic acid is very critical to the development of, of some organs in the body of the baby. Calcium is also required in higher amounts. A supplementation of 12 grams per day is needed and iron is up to 15 to 30 milligrams per day. Our baby is born. So we, we're not talking about prenatal now, we're talking about postnatal. Okay, but if the baby is not well fed during the prenatal malnutrition, I mean, <laughs> during the prenatal uh, period, there will be prenatal malnutrition, either under nutrition or over nutrition. So the feeding must be proper and appropriate during that prenatal uh, life. So the woman should not eat too much, but should eat just enough to support the growth of the baby. If there is under nutrition, there can be fetal growth retardation, interuterine death. Interuterine, for those who are not medically inclined, it means death of the baby right in the womb. The increase in still birth, that's birth at birth, I mean death at birth. Then poorer cognitive and neurological development. The brain starts developing right there in the womb. So if the baby is not well, is not properly nourished during that period, the brain will not develop well and that child will not have proper cognition because of the new, uh, there will be um, distortion of neurological development. High morbidity and mortality, deformity in different areas of the body. Like I mentioned, folic acid. If um, the child does not have access to adequate amount of folic acid, child can have neural tube defects. Increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular, and other degenerative diseases in adult life. I've explained that well enough. So our baby is born and what is required is infant feeding. The mother needs highly nutritious foods to keep energy high and milk production stable. So the mother should eat well to support uh, breastfeeding within the first six months of life. 
So exclusive breastfeeding is what is required. And that means that the baby gets only milk, no, no water, no herbal tea, no other food, not even vitamins or, or syrup, except if a drug is prescribed by a medical experts for specific reasons. So as public health physicians in the making, when you are through with this course, you have a big post because people will talk beside you, they will talk to you and they will tell you that that, milk, that breast milk is not enough for that baby. Baby is a, likes to eat and is not just enough. And now you are armed with the information that no matter how big that baby is, for the first six months of life, the breastfeed, breast milk is sufficient. The baby doesn't need water, doesn't need any other food. The, the breast milk has protein that the baby can easily digest. But infant formula that some people choose, though has higher amounts of protein, but is not easily digested by the baby. And that makes the human milk the optimal milk for the human child. Cow milk, the optimal milk for, I don't know the name for cow's children. <laughs> Maybe somebody can help me. Is it lamb or what is it? No, lamb Cow. is not. Cow. Cow. Thank you. So that's, that. their own best milk is the cow milk. But for human beings, the best is breast milk. And that should be given for six months. This breastfeeding should continue for 24 months. These things are very simple and you should master them. Make sure when you're answering question, which I believe is your first goal to pass this course and then to make use of the knowledge for public health as you go on. Please, whether you are speaking or you are writing, you're talking about breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding is very important. But apart from that, a mother should breastfeed until 24 months, not 18 months, not one year. Breastfeeding should continue till 24th month of life. That's the requirement. So when um, feeds are introduced at six months, that is called complementary feeding, not supplementary, complementary feeding. And that complementary is not C-O-M-P-L-I, it's P-L-E. It should be adequate. Child should be given the feed when required. Anytime the child indicates, then the child should be fed. And um, the feed should be pure, just in between solid and liquid. Should not be too watery because it will not contain enough calories. It should not be too thick so that the child will be able to digest it. So our goal at this stage, that's at six months, is to make the extra feeds as close to breast milk as possible. The quality of protein should be close to what is obtained in breast milk. This stage of complementary feeding is very critical in the life of a child because that's when the incidence of malnutrition usually sets in, if it's not well managed. I'd like you to look at this slide and compare the nutrient requirements during pregnancy and lactation. You realize that lactation requires much more energy than pregnancy. Within the first six months of life, the amount of breast milk that is needed is 750 meals per day. But during complementary feeding, when other feeds are introduced, then 600 meals per day will just be sufficient. The recommended dietary allowance of protein in pregnancy, like I said earlier, is just about 60 to 62 grams. But during lactation, it should be more. Remember that the baby is bigger and that baby is growing rapidly. The first year of life, is the time where maximum growth occurs. The next to that is adolescence. So this first year of life where maximum growth occurs, it should be supported by adequate amount of protein. And after six months, 
the amount of protein needed is 65 grams. This means that uh, per day, whatever feeds are being given as complementary feeds should contain adequate protein. Should the protein should be in a form that the child can easily digest. And you'll agree with me that if a mother therefore gives pap in the morning, afternoon and night, seven days of the week, as most mothers do, that child will not be getting enough protein because pap is a staple food that is majorly carbohydrate, especially if it's corn pap. If it's um, sorghum, it even contains more protein than um, corn pap. So protein is very important during complementary feeding and um, mothers should be taught to prepare food in a way that the child will take it and get adequate protein. Essential fatty acids are also crucial for fetal development, especially the membrane and the brain. So this is uh, during pregnancy now. That woman should uh, consume sufficient amounts of not just energy, not just protein, not just iron or calcium, but also fatty, essential fatty acids. This can be gotten from fish oil. And if the mother takes adequate amount, then the birth weight will be um, okay. Even if um, there was nutritional insult before and the mother decides to take fish oil supplement and it takes other um, feeds that will supply sufficient nutrients, that baby can still have catch up growth. Micro, I want to talk about micronutrient requirements. We've talked about fatty acids, protein, energy. So you need to know that during pregnancy, during lactation, Micronutrients are very important. So when we talk about undernutrition or malnutrition, three aspects should come to your mind whenever you, um, you're considering that word malnutrition. We are building on it. Initially, we said undernutrition and overnutrition. Now, I want you to look at undernutrition in terms of macronutrients or micronutrients. Can somebody tell us which ones are macronutrients? Abati, yesterday. What is macronutrient? Give us examples. Abiolu, victory. Abati is not on this Zoom call. So when we are taking attendance. I'm on this mood. I'm on, I'm, I'm on the really? Zoom meeting now. Yes, ma'am. I answered the but question. But I'm not with my glasses. I can't see very well. I'm with you. I'm with you, ma'am. You don't need glasses, ma madam. What is a All macronutrient? Right. Tell us. OK, don't define it. Just give me an example of macronutrient. An example of macronutrient are vitamins. And Abiolu, thank you, ma. Abiolu, give us example of macronutrient. Please mute your microphone, Abati. We have protein. We have um, lipids. Okay, you've tried. Mrs. Abati, Thank are you me. listening? I hope you are listening. Macronutrients yes. are carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Very simple. Very simple. Carbohydrates, protein, fat. Those three are the macronutrients. So what are micronutrients? ADBC, Deborah. What are micronutrients? Micro, micronutrients are needed in smaller quantity. Examples are vitamin, minerals. Very good. Thank you very much. Please, uh, as simple as those terms are, take note of them and be sure you understand them. If you've not uh, read my books, please try to lay your hands on them. You can borrow or buy or download from my website, whatever. Just try to read those books to get a good grasp of nutrition, get a baseline in your system 
so that you can understand this course very well and pass well at the end of the day. Thank you for taking note of that. Please remember that they're not compulsory, but it's good to know what is inside. Whichever method you decide to use to know the content of those books. They are basics, basic things that any adult, any child, anybody should know. Healthy diet and weight control. And then the other one is rich or poor, your child can be malnourished. So you will, you will, you will get all these things we're talking about there and you will know uh, micronutrients when you read that second book. Folacin, this is the only vitamin whose value is set at a higher value for pregnancy compared to lactation period. So for others, you need more during uh, lactation, but for folate or folacin, you need more during pregnancy because it plays a significant role in cell division and development. Remember that there's rapid cell division as that child is growing as it's developing. So if folate is not enough, then the child can have neural tube defects. If a lady gives birth to a child with neural tube defects, then that lady should prepare for the next pregnancy intelligently should take four milligrams of folic acid daily, at least four weeks before getting pregnant. Take it throughout the pregnancy and continue until three months after the pregnancy. So of course the baby is, uh, as is breastfeeding, is still getting some from the breast milk. Folate is more effective when it's given with vitamin B12. <clears throat> This table shows the difference between the requirements during pregnancy and during lactation. So you notice that um, the requirement for calcium and phosphorus is the same during pregnancy and lactation, but for magnesium is higher, for zinc is higher, iodine higher, selenium. So for most um, micronutrients is higher. But for iron and folate, the amount required in pregnancy is more. And that's why um, pregnant women are given micronutrient supplements in pregnancy. They, they're given iron and folic acid as micronutrients in pregnancy. The, uh, the vitamin requirements in, for A is also higher during lactation for vitamin C is also higher. But you will notice from this slide fully, that's the second to the last, that the requirements in pregnancy is much, much higher. If a baby is not well nourished, it's not given sufficient amount of foods needed, it can affect the brain development. And that can affect um, cognition or psychosocial development. The brain, the, the brain develops rapidly within the first two years of life. And by the end of three years, 80% of the brain is already determined, already fully developed. So that means that if within that first three years, the baby is not well fed, that child's brain will be, will be stunted for life. Protein energy on that nutrition can take place during this period. And if the, if the infant is not well fed, it can suffer from stunting. Stunting means height for age is shorter than expected. Child can suffer underweight. That means the weight for age is less than expected. These terms are very important you would need to use them anytime you are referring to child nutrition. Nutrition in children, you can't afford not to understand the difference between underweight, stunting, and thinness 
and I just explained the first two. Underweight means weight for age is too small compared to the expected. Stunting means the height for age is too short compared to the expected. And that is a chronic problem. It means this problem has been there for a long time, probably from the womb. This nutritional insult has been from the womb and the baby is shorter than his age mates. But when you pick a child and the height is normal, but the weight is lower than, ex than expected for that height, then that child is suffering from a recent problem, is an acute problem, is not a long-term problem. Because in the long term, the child has attained the height expected. So there hasn't been nutrition problem up till the recent times. So maybe the child just had diarrhea or measles or malaria or any other disease, and the child was not eating well, or the food that the little that was being taken was not well absorbed, or even the one that was absorbed was wasted by the fever, because fever wastes calorie. And because of that, the child is now weighing less than expected. That is thinness, and that's a short-term problem. Please make sure you understand those three terms and use them appropriately when needed. If a child is not well nourished, it can influence adults' um, susceptibility to diet-related chronic diseases. I've explained this over and over again. Diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, and other diseases are related to undernutrition in childhood or even overnutrition in childhood. Childhood nutrition. So the baby is now um, at the toddler stage. Make sure you continue to feed responsibly, not responsibly. It's only when that child needs food you give and when the child makes a cue for food, feed. Adequate protein and energy-rich foods are needed at this stage. And at least three portions of fruits and vegetables are needed by children generally. So avoid undernutrition and at the same time, avoid obesity. This is the stage where dietary pattern is formed and whatever pattern is formed continues with this child forever. Therefore, children should not be given junks, should not be given uh, only processed food because the parents are busy or because you think you are pampering that child. No, you are spoiling the child big time because when the child develops sweet tooth and she continues like that, that child is likely to suffer from several diseases in later life. Parents and caregivers are role models and therefore should eat right so that they can train their children to eat right. If a mother doesn't eat vegetable, how will the child learn and be willing to eat vegetables to be difficult? One of the strategies that can be used to encourage children to eat right is to have family meals, at least once daily, the whole family should be eating the same meal around the same time. So you can ensure that these children are getting at least one meal that is balanced, not noodles and fried plantain all the time. If a child is not well nourished, even though that child is beyond one year, is no longer an infant, is not even a toddler, maybe is in school now, a school age children, several things can occur. So for those who are uh, between one and two years, they can suffer from kwashoko, parasmos is within the first year. And for all, of, all other children, they can suffer from underweight, stunting, and thinness. They can have micronutrient deficiency, can be vitamin D or vitamin C or any of the other vitamins. <clears throat> If they're not well nourished, they can have infection and I've explained 
how infections affect nutritional status. There can be poor cognitive development. Since the brain is not well developed, these children will not perform well in school and will not be able to uh, run, start and run a good business or get a good job, and that will affect their productivity. In the short term, when the child is not fed, on that particular day, that child will not be able to concentrate. And you'll be surprised that many children in our days don't eat breakfast. So that affects their concentration in school, even though their nutritional status is, is good generally. But for those days they don't eat breakfast, their concentration is affected and that can affect performance. Just like the poor brain development can affect performance, the lack of concentration or um, skipping meals can also affect performance. Our baby is now 10, 10 years. So that period between 10 and 19 is called adolescence. And nutrition matters a lot during this adolescence. This is the second period of rapid growth after the first year. Adolescence, uh, about one quarter of the population, yet at, it, attention is not really paid to them. Even uh, people that put up programs for health are more concerned about children, uh, about mothers, some are concerned about elderly, but we all need to be concerned about adolescents because they form one quarter of the whole population in many developing countries, including Nigeria. So if 25% of the population is just pushed aside, then a lot can happen. That stage is important because they require a lot of energy, as much energy as adults because they're growing, puberty sets in, there's sporting growth, there's increase in metabolic rate. All this require a lot of energy. And they are also very active, greater deal of physical activity compared to adults, compared to children. Children can still be staying with their mother, staying at home, but an adolescent is there and there. They need energy to do all the runs. So they need extra energy, extra protein for growth. They need more micronutrients, especially calcium, folate, iron, and zinc. During this stage, it's important to encourage adolescents to eat right. Healthy diet is important to obtain adequate nutrients. The recommended um, daily intake for calcium is 1,300 milligrams for adolescents, and that's a lot. That's higher than uh, for an adult or pregnant women. Even for pregnant women, it's higher. If you remember the slide I showed you that uh, showed the figures, of the amount of nutrients, micronutrients needed. Calcium um, requirement is 1,200 for pregnant women and lactating women. But adolescents need 1,300 because I mentioned that they are growing and they need the calcium for the proper development and growth of the bones. The sources of calcium is milk. The major source of calcium is milk. So you can say sources of calcium are milk and milk products like cheese, yogurt, and so on. Girls especially need more iron, just like boys need more zinc. What iron is for girls in terms of the reproduction need is what zinc is for men. Men need zinc for production of the testosterone. The recommended dietary allowance for iron for females age 14 to 18 years is 15 milligrams, for male is 11 milligrams. So you can understand that the females are menstruating and they're losing a lot of blood. Iron deficiency is common amongst adolescents. And sources of iron can be enriched grains, lean meats, legumes, and vegetables. So this slide just explains what I've said about calcium. Half of peak bone mass accumulates in adolescence. And if they don't get enough calcium, there will be low peak bone mass 
and they can also be osteoporosis in later life. Osteoporosis affects females a lot. Um, it's not just enough to know the sources of calcium, it's also good to know a substance that can block absorption of calcium. And that is one example is caffeine. Many adolescents take caffeine for, um, let's say for reading you know, to, to enable them stay awake to read. And they might not know the effect it's having on their growth. So we as experts should know and educate others to desist from taking caffeine, especially they are still growing. Adolescents are also susceptible to disordered eating and eating disorders. So several nutrition disorders may emerge if they are involved in disordered eating. It can lead to anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and um, these disordered eating and eating disorders are more prevalent in adolescent females than males. The reason is because the adolescents are conscious of their body image. The females are more conscious of their body image and they don't want to gain too much weight. So they try to avoid food or eat junks and eat all kinds of things. They look for a way to vomit, <laughs> vomit it or engage in a lot of exercise, strenuous exercise to be able to lose the weight. That is bulimia nervosa. For those who don't eat, just take one tomato or eat one egg, avoiding carbohydrates, they can suffer from anorexia nervosa. And these are psychiatric problems that result from eating disordered eating. These eating disorders and disordered eating are linked with poor body image. So for the purpose of emphasis, disordered eating just means that someone has symptoms that looks like eating disorder, but the, the, but the symptoms and or signs are not classical enough to fit the criteria set by the American Psychiatry Association. Therefore, it's called disordered eating. So if, the, if somebody has different symptoms put together, we cannot call it anorexia nervosa, we cannot call it bulimia nervosa, we cannot call it some other um, eating disorders that are known and defined by American Psychiatry Association, then we just call whatever that person has disordered eating. So that's the difference between disordered eating and eating disorder. So for the purpose of this class, because if I'm to teach disordered eating now, it will take me one hour. Just note anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa as examples of eating disorders. And that any disorder that will not fit into classical eating disorder, we lump all of them together and call them disordered eating. What is important for this class is just to say that adolescents are more predisposed to eating disorders and disordered eating period. And this is linked with poor body image or low self-esteem. So when people have body dissatisfaction, body image dissatisfaction, they are dissatisfied with their look, with their shape, with their I, with whatever, and they have low self-esteem, then they start eating in an erratic way or avoiding food, dieting. So in the process of dieting, they can develop disordered eating. And when the disordered eating becomes very classical and can fit into specific definitions because of specific criteria, we now call it eating disorder, which is a psychiatry problem. The adolescents often adopt on healthy habits, they eat junk, so it's important to ensure that they eat with the family at least once a day. This period of adolescence is a big window of opportunity and the last window of opportunity 
for nutritional compensation. If there is no intervention at this stage and that adolescent goes into adulthood without uh, sufficient nutrients to make up for all the deficiencies, then that's the end. There's no other chance again. That guy can be shot for life. The girl can be shot for life and there is no other remedy. This stage is very important because if wrong habits are addressed the, and, and the person deals with those things before entering into adulthood, then a lot uh, can still be done. But if it's not addressed at this stage, that adult is likely to suffer several health challenges. So if adolescents suffer malnutrition, several consequences can follow. If it's under nutrition, adolescents can be stunted, can have anemia, uh, folate deficiency, other micronutrient deficiency. They can be permanent impairment of mental growth, impaired cognitive development and behavior. When you see people behave nasty, don't get angry again. Many of them are undernourished. <laughs> and it affects their cognition. That ability to reason and understand situations and behave appropriately, people cannot have it if their brains are not well developed. So if you are disturbing yourself, getting angry, why are people like this? Why, do, why are they so rude? Why are they? Just remember nutrition class. Many of them have poor cognition because their brain were not fully developed then you remember that and just move on with your life smiling. They can also be overweight and obesity because adolescents eat a lot of junks and they are trying to explore life. They are no longer obeying their parents to eat vegetables, to sit down and eat right. They want to do whatever they like. So they may end up with obesity. 80% of Overweight and obese adolescents, we end up as overweight and obese adults. So our baby is now 20, growth has stopped. Then he moves on to 21 and enters adulthood. So from 21 to 64 is adulthood and 65 and beyond is elderly. I hope there's no elderly person in this class. Otherwise, all of us should, should honor that elderly. <laughs> there should be no elderly taking MPH or MSc. But I suppose most people in this class will be within the range of adulthood. So if you are 60, you are not yet elderly. But Nigerians, even when they are 50, they want people to be calling them daddy and elderly. So please get the correct definition. Don't be carried away. Diseases and disabilities are not inevitable. So people should not assume that because you are now 60, you are entitled to diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and all these things. It's possible to avoid diseases. Longevity and diseases depend on several things. Genetics, 19%, healthcare, access to healthcare, 10%, environmental factors, 20%, and lifestyle factors, 51%, 51%. So that means lifestyle is very important in determining how long you will live. So if you eat right, you are increasing your lifespan. You do exercise, you are prolonging your lifespan, manage stress. Other lifestyle factors like exposure to sunlight, uh, smiling, laughing, being happy, maintaining good relationships, all those things as simple as they sound can prolong somebody's life. Talking about nutrition and healthy diet, it's important that adults eat a wide variety of foods per day, drink enough water for females at least 2.5 liters, for males, at least three liters, but on a, on a sunny day and um, dry period like this, more fluid will be needed. 
please make sure it's water you're taking, not carbonated soft drinks. During this adulthood stage, energy intake should be um, the same as energy expenditure so that there will be no extra to store. Less protein, less carbohydrate, less fat are needed compared to adolescents. So you can see that macronutrients are supposed to be less as they are growing older, while micronutrients should be increasing. That's the reason behind the recommendation that five serving of fruits and vegetables are needed. I'm almost through, but I need a water break. Apart from nutrition, physical activities are also very important uh, during this stage of life. It's uh, recommended that adults should get engaged in moderate exercise for at least 30 minutes per day. Remember that exercise just means planned, repetitive movement of the body. Any movement at all counts. And that's why everybody should be involved in physical activities. Whether you're carrying things, climbing stairs, cooking, cleaning the house, walking to the bus stop, whatever makes your body to move counts. So please accumulate a lot of movement. Even where you are seated, move as an adult. That's what counts. But because we don't do enough, we're busy people sitting by our laptop for hours, that's why it's important that all adults should get involved in planned exercise. So that way, when you do it consistently for at least 30 minutes every day, at least five days a week, it's better to target every day than you can fall into five days a week. Then you will improve your health significantly. So we're talking about patients, clients, public, but when we get to this level, because it affects you, we refer to you so that when you adopt ED last time, it's easier for you to advocate for it for others. But you cannot give what you don't have. So if you don't adopt it, it's difficult to even remember. I, I asked the MPH class, how many of them take at least five servings of fruits and vegetables. I think only two people, and those, one of the two was busy eating five servings of fruits alone. <laughs> that's, that's not the recommendation. The recommendation is two servings of fruits and at least, no, at yes, at least three servings of vegetables. So that's just a little, um, tip on LD diet that I forgot to mention when I was talking about LD diet. So practice the right thing and then you'll be able to help others to practice the right thing. Physical activities or exercise would improve every organ and system in the body. It will also improve your strength generally and you'll be able to maintain muscle mass. When you see elderly people looking wrinkled, losing uh, protein, not maintaining muscle mass, they're probably not doing enough exercise. Because you need not just protein, but also exercise to be able to build muscle. And that muscle will help you to, to combat fat that wants to deposit in your body. So adults should improve activities of daily living by getting engaged in exercise so that they are strong and they are able to carry out their daily activities. Exercise will make you feel better both mentally and physically.
During the elderly stage, this is for elderly now, certain nutrients are at risk of inadequate intake. Protein, there's a risk of not taking enough protein. There's a risk of taking excess energy. Because if an elderly person doesn't realize that he can't even metabolize carbohydrates the same way a younger person would, and is not moving around as much as the younger people are moving around, therefore doesn't need as much energy. If that person continues to eat the way she, she was eating at 30, then extra energy will be stored in the body. Other nutrients that are at risk of inadequate intake include folate, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, vitamin D, because they don't go out. Elderly people don't like going out. They just prefer to stay in one place. Zinc, calcium, phytonutrients, and water. Phytonutrients are bioactive substances that are found in natural fresh foods, natural foods. So they can be phytochemicals, antioxidant, all kinds of bioactive substances. So when you eat uh, vegetable, you get a lot of phytonutrients. It's not only nutrients, not only carbohydrate, protein, fats, vitamin, minerals, and water that are found in food. There are other substances in food and they are called bioactive substances. Fiber is also in food, so you know there is no only nutrients that are in food. If there is malnutrition at this stage of uh, adults and elderly, what are the consequences? We're no longer talking about protein energy on their nutrition. So if there is malnutrition, most likely a kind of uh, imbalance. There can be protein energy disnutrition. There can be low energy low productivity, or it can be obesity, and, and then definitely when um, an elderly person has or adult has malnutrition, there'll be higher risk of non-communicable disease because their own malnutrition is likely to be obesity. So investing, does anybody have any question before I conclude? This one hour of talking, you don't have any. Yes, yes ma. Ma. Okay, please. Yes, go you have a question, ma. Go ahead. Um, ma, please. I would like you to explain what portion means. Please, ma. Portion. Okay. Thank okay. you, ma. Uh, in the nutrition parlor, serving. people refer to portion or serving. And it varies from food to food. So when we're talking about fruits and we talk about one serving, one serving of uh, fruits is one apple, one small apple, or the size of one orange, or half cup, half cup of chunked fruits. So if you peel purple and chunk it and put in a cup, if the cup is full, that's two servings. If it's half, that is one serving. If you cook vegetable and you have, you're taking a cup of vegetable, whether raw vegetable like carrots or cooked vegetable, one cup is two servings. Half cup is one serving. So the, the correct term is serving. But when people are serving food, maybe in restaurants, <coughs> they can be talking about portion. <coughs> Ma, I have my question. I have a question, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Okay, it was with relation to you're talking of when you're talking of folates, you mentioned folates or folacin. I don't know the difference between folate and folacin. Ignore the folacin, just take folate. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I have a question too. Go ahead. You talked about an adolescent who is not well fed. 
if she gives birth when she's an adolescent, it can result into uh, generational uh, insult, nutritional insult. Now, if the adolescent grows to become a young adult, maybe 20, 21, and at that stage, eats well, fits very well, can that fetal origin of disease be corrected at that stage? After adolescence, eh? Yes, ma. You cannot. Okay. After Thank adolescence, you. that's the essence of this topic. That's why we are here this night. That if you don't do all we can before adolescence is over, then the chance is lost forever. Okay, ma. Mm. Thank you. Yes, ma. I have a question, ma. Yes, sir. Yes, ma. You are talking about nutrition and um the the variables that can actually improve the chances of a child and heredity now can we connect heredity to nutrition for instance like the last speaker has spoken that if if a child now has inherited that intelligence then um the environment isn't favorable and likewise he or she is not feeling well. And um, maybe sometimes the child not have the access to boost its nutritional level. Can that intelligence be traced? Hey, can that, yes, the intelligence be retraced? Or it is also lost based on the, the last person that asked the question. You said if the child was born with intelligence. Yes, that is heredity. And the environment is not favorable. And he's not, he's not having good nutrition. So maybe after some while, he has the opportunity to have good access to nutrition oh, again. Thank you. So after some while, when? Okay, before let me assume before. Two years before, or after two years? He, um, yeah, doing a childhood to adolescent stage, within that stage now. Sir, can you tell us the age you are describing? After two okay, years, adolescent or age, years. man. Ten to nineteen years, man. That's when you now intervene and give good food, right? Yes, man. Yes. Okay. Ma. So if you start giving good food by age ten, the opportunity for brain development is already lost. Okay. Because the opportunity stops by three. By okay. age three, almost ninety percent, well over eighty percent of the brain. Is fully developed. So what are you going to do? That's why we are all here. Okay. That's why we are here this night when you should be resting on your bed. That's why we're talking <laughs> about, that's why public health is concerned about public health nutrition. And we're making advocacy, begging everybody, the mother, the parents, the family, the government, that if you don't intervene within first 1,000 days of life, that's okay. from pregnancy till two years, then we lose the chance forever. And that's why we have many people in Nigeria that have poor cognition, poor brain development, because okay. they were not properly fed in childhood. Okay. Can Thank I move you, on now? Yeah. Yes, ma. Thank you, ma. Okay. So investing in nutrition. Ma, please, I want nutrition. to ask you. Okay, go ahead. Ma, you are saying one serving is one cup. What kind you of don't cup? You did not say that half cup. In the nut I said yes, half, not one cup. Okay, ma. One what kind of cup? Half. In the nutrition balance, a cup is 250 mil 40 meals. Okay. That's like okay, a tea thank cup. You. Tea cup. Okay. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. 240 meals. So you can even say one serving is 120 meals of food. Half a cup. 
And if you don't want to bother yourself with you. measuring cup, just say the size of one small apple, the size of one orange. Size of one orange. Don't okay, raise up your hand. Just go ahead and ask your question quickly. Good evening, ma. Good evening, madam. Yes. yes. Here's my question, ma. I have a case of a baby that is suffering from this uh, malnutrition, uh, nutritional insults, ma. And then the last time I was in the clinic with him, I asked the doctor what can be done. He doesn't have appetite. And he already has a stunted growth. He's prone to um, infection. He has this low birth weight and all of that. And we know force feeding is wrong. So I asked the doctor, what else can we do? It doesn't have appetite, it doesn't heat, it doesn't want to eat anything. What can be done? And all he said was, we should just keep looking for food that he loves to eat. And he doesn't like any food. And he has been like that since. Okay, madam, this, yes, this, yes, this, this is a special case. That child should okay. be taken to uh, the the hospital, it can be a case of severe acute malnutrition, which has okay. standard, there are standard ways of managing such. Some of them may okay. even need to be given, um, what do we call this thing in the hospital? I can't remember at the moment, but they, okay. some of them may even need admission. So I don't know. It, if you don't see that, I just describe it and describe it with passion. I will not be able to tell you the specific treatment because there are specific treatments for specific uh, situations. Is the child severely undernourished or is it moderate? All those things matter. Is, is he already in a lethargic state? Does he even need IV, IV fluid? Or do you need... Um, there are these feeds that are special feeds given to children that are concentrated micronutrients in like a bar or something. So we need to see that child okay. in the hospital and okay. diagnose, have a specific diagnosis before we now give specific okay. uh, management. And many of them okay. will uh, do well to be resuscitated with IV fluid and then they now begin to feed them suddenly. Okay, Mary Thomas, go ahead. Iretio, go ahead. Now, I'm good evening, ma. More than two again. I think we need to. Good evening, ma. Good evening, ma. Thanks to today's lecture, ma. God bless you, ma. Amen. Ma, my question is: uh, What is the effect of uh, what is the effect of neural tube defect on the newborn? Do you know what neural tube defect is? Do you know it? No, no. I want you to explain more. It means the spinal cord is not developed, it opens well, up. Is it is it that when there is a hole? Yes. In the, okay. In the, there is hole in the brain. Brain, okay. <laughs> so is it the brain that continues to the to the back that at the back? back. So it opens, okay. it's not it's not developed. Okay, ma. Yes. Okay, ma. Thank, thank you, ma. All this raising your hand. Ask your question quickly. Let's go and sleep now. Um, hello, ma. Hello, sir. Yes, ma. Please, I before you conclude the lecture, I want to please ask for your website. Your website. You can get the information. Want to ask for what? I can't hear you. Your network is. The website, your website you mentioned for my website is proldliving.com. Yeah. Proldliving.com. Proldliving.com. It's on the first slide she gave us. The first okay. slide. Go and check okay. it there. It's on every slide that I will give you. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm typing it in your chat room now. Yeah, it's in your chat room now. ProLDLiving.com. Are you happy now? ProLDLiving.com. Yeah. So investing in nutrition throughout the life cycle has both short-term and long-term benefits. 
has economic and social significance. I explained to you that's the long term benefit. There's reduction in morbidity and mortality. Morbidity means sickness. That means there's low level of sickness in such children. Mortality means death. Less children will die if we feed them well. There's increased educability and intellectual capacity. If people are well fed, then they are easy to teach or they, they learn easily. They have better intellectual capacity. The adults, if they eat well, they also have increased adult productivity. And if we, as a country, pay attention to nutrition, then we can have large savings in healthcare costs. But if we don't, we we'll continue to move around and around the same circle as we have been moving and be incurring a lot on healthcare, whereas we could have spent just a fraction of what we're spending on healthcare if we had put more of the investment in nutrition. If people are well fed, then they can prevent intergenerational malnutrition. So you can decide to stop with your own children, stop in your own circle and alter that cycle. To eat is a necessity, but to eat intelligently is an art. Why don't you start eating intelligently and pass it on to others that come across you, whether professionally or just in your daily life? Thank you. Each stage of life demands adequate nutrition. That's the message of tonight's lecture. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. You're welcome. So click that website. You. you can download the health books from there. And you can approach Mrs. Momo or Iretiolu to, to buy hard copies. But please read them. My interest is that you read them and have a good grasp of nutrition as a good foundation for this course. Bye. Thank you, Mia. You are welcome, ma. Thank you, ma. God bless you, ma. Amen. Thank you, ma. Thank you, too. Thank you, Ma. During the alleged assault, my client.